This is the fourth lecture in this series on calcium and phosphate disorders, and the specific topic is hyperphosphatemia. There are actually relatively few clinical manifestations that are a direct consequence of hyperphosphatemia. The most common symptoms are actually those from the secondary hypocalcemia it can induce. Hyperphosphatemia may also cause deposition of calcium phosphate complexes into joints and soft tissues. And acute, severe hyperphosphatemia may cause acute phosphate nephropathy, a potentially irreversible form of acute kidney injury, most often associated with oral sodium phosphate laxatives, such as Fleet's phosphosoda. There are three general mechanisms by which hyperphosphatemia can develop. The first is increased GI intake. Because intact kidneys have an ability to excrete large amounts of excessive phosphate, it requires a very high acute phosphate load to induce hyperphosphatemia. This is seen most often with phosphate-containing laxatives, particularly when taken in large amounts, as was up until recently a common method to prepare for a colonoscopy. The most common laxative associated with hyperphosphatemia in this context was Fleet's phosphosoda. However, due to concern over its association with hyperphosphatemia and acute phosphate nephropathy, its manufacture and over-the-counter distribution in the U.S. stopped in late 2008. It may still be available in other countries, and similar products are still available in the U.S. by prescription. By far, the most common cause of hyperphosphatemia is decreased urinary excretion seen in renal failure. Typically, it occurs once the GFR drops below 20 to 25 milliliters per minute. Familial tumoral calcinosis, which has nothing to do with cancer, as its name suggests, is a rare autosomal recessive disorder that leads to hyperphosphatemia and deposition of calcium phosphate crystals in skin and subcutaneous tissues. It can be caused by a loss of function mutation in the FGF23 gene, which normally would prevent excessive phosphate reabsorption in the renal tubule. As discussed in more detail in the videos on calcium disorders, hypoparathyroidism and vitamin D excess both can also lead to decreased urinary excretion of phosphate. And acromegaly, the syndrome of growth hormone excess, can lead to a mild hyperphosphatemia as well. In the category of internal redistribution is tumor lysis syndrome. This is usually caused by chemotherapy for treatment of tumors characterized by rapid cell turnover, such as lymphomas and leukemias, in which rapid death and lysis of massive numbers of tumor cells results in hyperphosphatemia, hyperkalemia, hyperuricemia, and azotemia. It can rarely happen in a cancer spontaneously without chemotherapy as well. Rhabdomyolysis, which is the rapid breakdown of massive numbers of myocytes, results in the same biochemical abnormalities. Lastly, lactic acidosis leads to hyperphosphatemia through a combination of cell death, acidemia-induced shift of phosphate out of cells, and decreased movement of metabolic intermediaries through glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, with a subsequent decrease in the generation of ATP. There is also an entity known as pseudohyperphosphatemia, which is a spurious elevation in serum phosphate as a consequence of substances interfering with its lab measurements. The most common cause is a paraproteinemia, for example, those seen in multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Other etiologies include hyperlipidemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and chronic infections such as HIV in which circulating immunoglobulin may interfere with the lab assay. A diagnostic clue to the presence of pseudohyperphosphatemia is a normal serum calcium, which is uncommon in true hyperphosphatemia. When it comes to the diagnostic evaluation, the cause of clinically relevant hyperphosphatemia is rarely a diagnostic mystery. When uncertain as to the etiology, it is best to start by working up the likely concurrent calcium disorder. Treatment decisions for hyperphosphatemia depend upon its acuity, and the patient's renal function. If the hyperphosphatemia is acute and renal function intact, when mild, therapy is unnecessary as it will usually resolve within 6 to 12 hours. If the degree of hyperphosphatemia is potentially life-threatening, as might be seen with excessive administration of a phosphate laxative, 
One could consider normal saline infusion plus or minus acetazolamide to further assist with phosphate excretion. If the renal function is impaired, it may take significantly longer than 12 hours for normalization of the phosphate level, and hemodialysis should be considered, though this is rarely necessary. In chronic hyperphosphatemia, when renal function is intact, if the underlying etiology is vitamin D excess or hypoparathyroidism, treatment of the underlying condition is usually sufficient. For familial tumoral calcinosis, treatment requires a low phosphate diet and phosphate binders. Finally, in chronic hyperphosphatemia with impaired renal function, a low phosphate diet and phosphate binders are standard. For patients on phosphate binders, the goal of therapy varies slightly depending on the situation. If the indication is chronic kidney disease, stage 3 to 5, uh, for a patient who's not on dialysis, the goal of therapy is to restore serum phosphate to the normal range. For patients on dialysis, the goal phosphate is 3.5 to 5.5 mg per deciliter. And for the rare patients with familial tumoral calcinosis, unfortunately the goal serum phosphate is not clearly established, but is probably normal. When it comes to the specific choice of a phosphate binder, there are only a couple of options. The first are calcium salts such as calcium carbonate or calcium acetate, also known by the brand name as FOSLO. Calcium salts achieve adequate control of hyperphosphatemia in about 70% of patients with chronic kidney disease. Although calcium carbonate is typically cheaper, calcium acetate may be preferred for patients on PPIs or H2 blockers. They are most effective if taken with meals, and hypercalcemia is a common side effect, particularly if combined with vitamin D, which is common to do and not usually an error per se. The next option is Sevelomer, brand name in the US of Renagel. This is a cationic polymer that binds phosphate through ion exchange. It contains no calcium and thus has a much lower risk of hypercalcemia. In general, Sevelomer has better outcomes than calcium salts, but is much more expensive and possibly not cost effective when applied to all patients with chronic kidney disease. As a consequence, it's usually reserved for renal patients whose calcium is above 9.5 mg per deciliter, or those whose calcium is 8.4 to 9.5 mg per deciliter, and also have low PTH or significant vascular calcifications. The last option is lanthanum, which in the U.S. is sold under the name of phosrenal. Lanthanum is a rare earth element. As compared to Sevelomer, it is not as well studied, but generally has the same advantages, disadvantages, and indications. That concludes this much shorter talk on hyperphosphatemia. The next and final video in the calcium phosphate series will cover hypophosphatemia.